Uh, thank you, Dennis. And uh, I'm going to, as Dennis said, give a brief overview of some of the work on etiology and course of substance use disorders, but focusing on uh, uh, alcohol, uh, but uh, bringing in some other relevant data as well. And I'm going to start out by uh, showing a slide from a book I wrote about 25 years ago where I was asked to summarize everything we knew about children of alcoholics. And it was a daunting task, and, but I tried to, as best I can, sift through the extant literature uh, at the time. And uh, what we might call the, whoops, I went to what we might call the exogenous variable, the variable I was trying to explain the effects of its family history of alcoholism. And it generated people looking at basically the correlates of why do people who are children of alcoholics tend to become alcoholic themselves. And one of the things, so the first thing I did was I just tried to map out, at least as best I could, what the various kinds of connections were. And uh, a very large proportion of the work focused on inherited characteristics associated with uh, personality and with cognitive function. But to my way of thinking, the interesting thing is, well, how does that translate? That's just giving us a static correlation. And uh, we proposed at that time, and much of the work uh, both uh, that I've done and my colleagues have done have really tried to focus on specific mechanisms implied and, by this and related to these uh, basic dispositional difference. One focused on negative emotionality. Uh, many of you are familiar with the idea of self-medication or tension reduction. Uh, another focused on the idea of deviant socialization. That is, individuals who may be uh, more impulsive, uh, hang out with uh, kids who are substance abusing or rule violating in some way. And the other is basic individual differences in alcohol effects uh, that could go either of two ways. Either some people get much more reinforcement out of alcohol, therefore it's a better drug for them in certain ways. Or alternatively, some people are less sensitive. And so in order to get desired effects, they expose themselves to uh, more harmful levels. And in fact, uh, in the Department of Psychological Sciences here at MU, we have people who focus really on all three of these kinds of mechanisms. I'm going to shift a little bit and talk about the diagnosis of a substance use disorder uh, and the criteria for a drug use disorder and alcohol use disorder are the same. There are these 11 criteria. I'm not going to go through all of them. The point I'd like to make is, what it's a hodgepodge. Uh, there is no theoretical framework that's really uh, been used to develop a rational diagnostic system. And uh, related to that, there's no conceptual core. It's not to say it doesn't work or it's not meaningful. But within the current DSM-5, the current classification, uh, two of 11 of these symptoms are required. Uh, just want you to think this through a little bit. It means that uh, with the current diagnostic system, there's over 2,000 ways to diagnose. And uh, even uh, with people who have, uh, there's like 55 possible configurations of people who have uh, two symptoms and two, simple, uh, two symptoms only, if you just do the combinatorics. And uh, work with my uh, former postdoc, Sean Lane, we've shown that even with people with the same symptom count, depending upon the symptoms, we see different kinds of correlates. When we look, and this really builds on uh, Sandy's work, at what the prevalence of AUD is, of course, the lifespan, you see this, basically the third decade of life, you know, people in late teens, early uh, to mid-20s, uh, the highest prevalence throughout the lifespan. Uh, many people think, well, 
Maybe those are false positives. It doesn't make sense. You know, clinicians say, that's not what I see coming through my clinic necessarily. And I think this recent paper uh, from NIAAA uh, makes us take it a little bit more seriously. Uh, I would have said a priori that a lot of those people who are diagnosing very early, they're all just mild. They're basically just barely super threshold. That's not the case, I mean, as these data suggest. And so it means that this group of individuals, even though they might not have all the hallmarks we typically think of addiction or chronic alcoholism in terms of compulsive use, they're still experiencing a large number of problems. Uh, uh, this is work we did in our uh, lab using the same data, uh, similar data sources uh, that Alvaro Verges worked on and said, well, if we take a look at these individuals who diagnose at a given time, uh, can we identify those people who are recent onsets, uh, people who are chronic, and people who are more episodic in their course? And what we see over the course of time is, first of all, a mix at every observation period, um, but also that a large part of the decrease we see over the lifespan is due to decreases in new onset and recurrences as opposed to uh, changes in the chronicity of the problem. Uh, in Alvaro uh, and uh, our lab, we also extended this to drug use disorder, uh, where we see something similar, except that the new onsets tend to represent a larger proportion of cases at each time. So I think the question comes is like, why this huge decrease? If there's you know, nothing from a talk like I give is, what do you learn today? It's, wow, this developmental age gradient in substance use disorders is huge. Um, and so people have tried to explain it and say, well, why might it be decreasing? One might be differential mortality, that those people who are using uh, tend to die off and not be part of your population base. Uh, and even though there is, as Sandy noted, uh, high mortality associated with uh, substance use, or I should say it's a risk for uh, mortality, that really can't explain more than a tiny percent of that. And another one is, well, what about formal treatment or self-help? Uh, and actually, if we look at the proportion of people who diagnose, who actually seek help, uh, that can't really explain it either. Uh, it's not to say it doesn't explain some of it, but it's a very small proportion. And the reason, the explanation that's usually given is role incompatibility. And these are data from uh, older data, but they actually still look the same from the Monitoring the Future project on binge drinking. I'm gonna just show the men in the interest of time. The women data are virtually the same. And so this is whether or not they had a binge occasion basically in the last two weeks. And if you look at those people who are single at both a baseline and a two-year follow-up, you see pretty high rates. And if you look at people who are married at both times, uh, you see pretty low rates. And if you look at people who are divorced, you know, formally married at both times, they look like the single people. But the interesting cases are the ones where there's a change in status. And what happens when someone gets married? It decreases their binge drinking, decreases quite a bit. And what happens when somebody gets divorced? It goes up. And so we need to think about substance use in you know, this part of the environment of intimate or close relationships and how important that is. And we could look at other variables related to adult role occupancies, like being a member or, uh, of the workforce and other things that basically kind of constrain your opportunities for use. But we became interested, is that all there is? Is it that simple that people still want to party but they really don't have time anymore because they have responsibilities being a parent or being a worker? I know last night I didn't have a drink at dinner. I did have a drink before dinner, but not because I knew I had to be here before 7.30. You know, so uh, is it just those kinds of uh, environmental constraints? And one of the things we looked at was personality, and these are data from a meta-analysis by Brent Roberts. And what you see is over the course of development, uh, and this is good news, people become more mature. 
They become more emotionally stable. They become more conscientious. And uh, we know those are two traits that are strongly related to whether or not somebody uses substances, particularly the conscientiousness and the emotional stability, a higher risk for uh, substance use disorders. And we thought that when we were looking at how steep that curve was, it's also particularly steep during the third decade of life. We thought, could this possibly be associated with this other phenomenon, so-called maturing out? And when we looked at our own data, this was a cohort we started studying in 1987, we see the same kinds of findings that came out of the meta-analysis of Brent Roberts is, yeah, our subjects are becoming less neurotic and less impulsive, or in the words of Big Five, uh, uh, more emotionally stable and more conscientious. And when we looked at the alcohol problems in the sample, we saw those were decreasing as well. So we thought, okay, well, let's see, is there a correlation? Is it just happening at the same time, or are these seem to be coupled processes? And I'll just try and explain this a little. We could think of this as a cross-sectional baseline correlation. And these slopes, this is how much your impulsivity is changing uh, over the 17-year period, and how much your uh, alcohol involvement is changing over this period, and we could look at the correlations between changes in one and changes in the other. The first thing I want to highlight is this thing, which is like a rolling compatibility effect. It's not like we don't find it. It's there. But the thing we find most noticeable is changes in impulsivity are strongly associated with changes in alcohol use. And if we do this with neuroticism as well, uh, we see very similar finding that the correlation in, between change in personality and change in uh, substance involvement is just as strong as it is between the baseline levels. Of it. And again, we see this effect, the rolling compatibility effect. But we also see this other nice effect too, and that is actually becoming involved in a committed relationship is good for your emotional stability. And um, it's sometimes called the maturity principle, that these engagement in adult roles have very widespread effects uh, on psychosocial maturation. So uh, again, I could only focus on a few topics here today, but uh, obviously relationships are one thing we looked at, but what about other environments? And we are here on a university campus. Uh, and I don't put this, I just, I give talks at a number of universities on college student drinking. And before I go, I just Google the campus, alcohol, Greek. There's always some kind of lurid headline. And the University of Missouri is not exempt. And so by putting it up, I don't mean to cast us in a bad light. This is just say this is a national problem. And in fact, the whole question of should we be, you know, allow fraternities to exist has become part of uh, the national debate and in leading national publications like Time and uh, the New York Times. So we were interested in saying, well, what can we learn about the Greek system? And we've done a number of studies in that area. And uh, this was work with a uh, former student, Asun Park. And one of the things, so we, we actually got a hold of MU, incoming MU students before they matriculated, during summer welcome. And we were able to get data from them in high school, and then we followed them for the next four years. And one of the things is you want to know who are the people who are going to drink a lot as first semester freshmen, it's the people who are drinking a lot in high school. You know, half of the variance in how much somebody is uh, a binge drinking as a first semester uh, freshman could be explained by what they were doing before they got to college. It also explained who goes into the Greek system in part, and we call that environmental selection. That is, people seek out niches that are consistent with their desires and uh, predispositions and predilections. But once somebody is in the Greek system, 
It predicts how much they're drinking in the first semester itself, above and beyond their pre-college drinking, but also how much they drink over the next three years. And then we think, well, what happens when we bring these dispositional traits like personality into the picture? And in the study, we looked at impulsivity, extroversion, and neuroticism. So even though the parameters change a little bit there because we're uh, including other variables, they're very similar. But one of the things that we find interesting is even though we do see this correlation with pre-college heavy drinking we exist, is we see a pretty modest association with extroversion. But if we look at personality traits and who goes into the Greek system, we see a really strong association with extroversion, which makes us realize and think that environmental uh, uh, constructs like Greek houses are actually much more complex than we would think. There's multiple facets. Some people might like it for just the affiliation. Some people might like it for the service uh, components. Some people might like it for the easy access uh, to alcohol and other drugs. Uh, some people might like it because they think they'll be able to uh, date easier if they're in a high prestige Greek system. But the interesting thing is this, is people select into a high-risk environment, not necessarily to be able to use a substance, but then they're in a social trap, in a sense, in their, they've selected in on one characteristic and then are exposed to this other one. So uh, some basic take-homes from this are AUDs are very highly prevalent. And in fact, they typically show up in most psychiatric surveys as the most prevalent psychological disorder in the US population. Uh, they are largely, but by no means exclusively, uh, disorders of late adolescence and young adulthood. We might have to change that. Some of the, the epidemiologic surveys over the last 10 years have shown that actually the biggest increase, say, from like 2008 to 2018, there's a recent meta-analysis published, are in people about my age. And so there is some de you know, new demographic trends, but it doesn't really change that. It's still this big bulge uh, in earlier adulthood. Uh, remission often comes about through normal development, uh, both because of adult role occupancies and psychological maturation, and there are multiple etiological pathways. There is no single way that lead people to develop a compulsive drinking lifestyle or uh, another form of an alcohol use disorder. So uh, some of the things we're working on in uh, my lab and with some of my colleagues here is uh, what do we want to do going forward? And one of the things that has uh, captured my imagination is how do we make diagnosis better? Uh, and uh, I'll describe that a little bit. Uh, but attending to issues of like which symptoms are core or fundamental versus other ones that are kind of epiphenomenal. They show up and they might be helpful clinically in that they help you diagnose, but they're not a target of treatment necessarily, or maybe it would be a waste to make them a target of treatment because they're not influencing other ones. Uh, another one is when does a predisposition that might exist prior to substance exposure change to the point where it's actually a symptom of a disorder because very often uh, the traits that lead one to use uh, become more exaggerated after use. Uh, another question is how much does somebody have to experience a symptom before we say it's clinically important and should figure into a diagnosis? And whether or not we want to think of symptoms as actors in their own right that influence other symptoms or adopt the more traditional psychopathology perspective is there's disease entities uh, underlying most of these syndromes we're interested in and symptoms are simply manifestations of an underlying process. Uh, a recent paper, I guess it's still in press, uh, that I did with, uh, came out of a round table uh, I hosted at Research Society on Alcoholism uh, a couple of years ago, uh, where I brought together basic preclinical uh, animal modeler and uh, somebody who's a behavioral economist working in humans and tried to map out 
Okay, here's formal diagnostic criteria according to different diagnostic symptoms. But people in the uh, clinicians uh, might focus on core constructs like compulsive use, whether or not there's neuroadaptation, craving, uh, or uh, uh, whether or not there's a given preference for a specific drug. And, and here, really to the exclusion of other natural reinforcers. And then how did that line up with basic theories of addiction? And the main take home message from this is there's not a lot of correspondence, I shouldn't say that, there's moderate correspondence between what different uh, theories seek to explain and how we go about the diagnostic process. Uh, this is something that we've been interested in. We actually don't feel the state of the art is there yet, but that is how can we determine whether or not certain symptoms are more central or peripheral. A lot of people are interested in network modeling of symptoms. Uh, and uh, conceptually, it makes a lot of sense. But empirically, working with my colleague uh, Doug Steinle and graduate students uh, of Doug's, uh, we've kind of concluded it's a problematic state of the art. Even in, uh, but we still feel it's conceptually useful. Uh, this other piece of when do we decide a symptom is a symptom of disorder versus a predisposition is highlighted both by kind of rude and obnoxious behavior when drunk and people still drink, but a lot of times those people are rude and obnoxious when they're not drinking. Uh, and then alcohol sensitivity, there are several people in my department who are very interested in looking at low sensitivity as a risk factor, but we also, that's how we define tolerance. And, this is just to highlight, do we, how do we want to think about differences in overall sensitivity as a function of what might be inherited and what might be acquired? Uh, another issue is where do we decide that somebody has a symptom? And uh, uh, Sean uh, Lane, the postdoc I mentioned, I did a meta-analysis where we looked at the IRT thresholds of different diagnostic criteria and saw huge differences across different diagnostic interviews. And if we actually drill down and say, what might be going on here? You'll see some studies say, uh, and they'll, it'll be close to the wording in the DSM, uh, craving is a very strong desire or urge. Where other ones is, it was so, I had desire so strong, I couldn't think of anything else. And those, depending upon the sample, could have a five to 10 fold difference. And yet, they're accessing presumably the exact same symptom. And one of the things we've been working on with uh, one of the students in my lab is can we grade all symptoms and move away, like in clinical medicine and APGAR scores or coma scores or other places where we really think of each of these as dimensional and not categorical. And so I'm just going to uh, leave uh, with this notion that we could do a lot better in terms of how we conceptualize and diagnose substance use disorders and I think in doing so, it not only makes the research better in terms of having cleaner phenotypes, uh, but I also think it might suggest what are the most fruitful targets for intervention. And I just wanted to thank a number of the people. I can't thank everyone, unfortunately. Uh, but uh, uh, we have had great, first of all, great collaborators, uh, faculty in the department, and also uh, trainees, uh, graduate students, postdocs, and undergraduates. So thank you. Oh, I got to go.